be making some comments, after which we'll be opening the floor for questions. Yes? Well, good morning, everyone. I'd like to start off with Mr. Granger's pronouncement that Guyana will, quote, unquote, soon be a safer place. This is like offering Guyanese a pie in the sky. For example, bandits are now at the gates of the United Nations Development Program, UNDP. International public servants are now under attack. Hotels where tourists stay are under attack. The shopkeeper is under attack. So is the farmer. Residents within the peace of their homes are under attack. So are countless others. The criminals are here, there, and everywhere. They are omnipresent. First, Granger called for a crime-fighting plan. Secondly, we were told that the plan was with Ramjatan. Thirdly, we were told that the plan was with the National Security Council with Granger chairs. Fourthly, that the plan was with the Commission of Police to be tweaked. Fifthly, that the plan was to be made public. And sixthly, that there is no plan. In fact, there was never a plan. It was all a plan of deception that lasted for one year and a half. Now we are told that soon a security sector reform action plan will kick off. But there are more questions than answers in respect to this plan. What about the financing of this plan? Who will finance the plan? Will the plan be financed solely from the government coffers? How much will the British government contribute? How long is the plan for? And what are the key components of the plan? And finally, will the plan be made public? We were recently told by the Commission of Police Acting that the SWAT team is part of, quote unquote, a holistic crime fighting strategy. What strategy is he talking about? Is there one? If so, why has it not been made public or at least shared with stakeholders? as they promised they would. Perhaps there is none. And former Commissioner of Police Felix had once said that Guyana does not need a SWAT team. Now the police at the highest level are singing praises to the existence of the SWAT team set up by the PVPC administration. In fact, there was even talk of disbanding the SWAT team. On another matter, Mr. Dataram's disappearance is a slap in the face of the Granger administration, who had recklessly legitimized his questionable bona fides by setting up a commission of inquiry into the allegations he, Dataram, made against Kanu. The first slap in Granger's face was when the Commission of Inquiry came up empty-handed. Now, after 16 months in government, and notwithstanding all the rattle-tattle while in opposition, that there was no National Drug Safety Master Plan, when in fact there was one. 
This is the government that talks so much about efficiency and effectiveness in crime fighting and drug trafficking, yet it has no drug strategy, master plan, nor a, a crime fighting strategy. We are further told that plans are afoot to expand the Mazaruni prisons. But Ramjatan must say, what is the status of the Guyana Prison Service strategic plan? Has it been abandoned? Has it been replaced? If so, with what? Is the Mazaruni Prisons Expansion Plan part of the Guyana Prison Service strategic plan? What is all the secrecy about? Why keep taxpayers in the dark? Recently, we heard Mr. Gaskin speaking on behalf of the AFC. He called on Guyanese to quote unquote, gear themselves for increased economic growth. The question is, where is the growth to come from when the productive sector is being stifled, the manufacturing sector is in a slump, the public service is demoralized. The global economic environment remains hostile and non-responsive. Private sector investments remain frozen. Foreign direct investment is now a thing of the past. The private sector and business community is battered, ostracized, neglected, pressured, and heavily taxed, compounded by untenable industrial relations and social and political democracy that are consistently trampled upon. The government is now coming under pressure from the Private Sector Commission, the trade unions, the Ghana Gold and Diamond Miners Association, the political opposition, who are all pressing for solutions to address, for example, labor relations, matters affecting the business community, challenges in the mining sector, and political and racial discrimination and witch hunting. It is under these conditions that pressures are mounting in the face of a lazy, incompetent, lackluster, and sailing government. The AFC may be no police for the APNU, but it is certainly a prisoner of the APNU. Finally, the mayor of Georgetown has joined Joe Harmon in the no apologies refrain. She has publicly stated that, quote unquote, without any apologies to anyone, she sees no reason why a bankrupt city council should continue to pay a security service to protect the residents of Hamilton Green, a former mayor of Georgetown. Chase Green is reported as saying that all councillors voted in favour of her proposal. She is lying. PPP councillor Coupin did not. He opposed the request on the ground that Green is now employed at the Central Housing and Planning Authority, CHNPA, and therefore that agency should take, care, should take care of such expenses. And since in any case, Georgetown citizens were told that the council was broke. So where is the money to come from to finance the security of Green's residents? How much will it cost taxpayers? Here again, the question of transparency and accountability is brought 
into sharp focus. There's no transparency and accountability with respect to revenues, income and expenditures of the City Council. Money is easily and stealthily being moved around to suit the whims and fancies of the APNU AFC acolytes at City Council. The four subsidiary accounts are still not reflected in the City Council's overall accounts. The status with respect to City Hall's accounts is unsatisfactory and unacceptable. Information as it relates to the four accounts remains shrouded in a lack of accountability and transparency. There is clearly institutional resistance in establishing the veracity of these accounts. City Hall is deceptive in its approach to these four accounts. Often the cry from City Hall is that it is cash-strapped. An audit should establish that the council is broke. Why the continued institutional resistance to the public outcry for audit at City Hall? Thank you. Okay, thanks, and those were comments by the GS on a number of issues. Now we'll open the floor for questions. Who will be the floor? Ronald Gandhi, um, so do you think the police are still at since the launch of Operation Safeway, 1,500 persons have been brought in for questioning and prosecution. Do you think that this is a success? I think it's a little too early. I saw something in the media where the police was already crowing about how many uh, cases they've had to deal with. In less than a month, or in less than two weeks after the Operation Safeway was, grand, was, uh, was launched. I think it's a little too early. I mean, you know, these things need time. There's a specific period of time over which you need to make the comparative analysis between the corresponding period of one specific time of the current year and last year. So to crow over numbers at this point in time in order to create the impression that Operation Safeway has been a success. I think it's a somewhat premature at this point in time. Adam Harris, sir, to pick you up on the same thing about specific period of time needed to make comparative analysis. The same police used a period of time to show that crime was on the decline and you refused to accept that. And you talk about crime outside UNDP office, crime in people's homes, just about everywhere you said, but the record will show that this has always been the case. There were crime outside commercial banks, there was even a crime outside state house. So why are you insisting that the Granger comment of a gala being a safe place of failure? Because that's my job as a, a member of the political opposition. I can't do otherwise but to say that. I'm not going to praise Granger's crime-fighting policy because I don't know if there's one in the first place. I don't know about a robbery right in front of UNDP when we were in the government. So uh, Granger was free to speak about what he wanted to speak about when they were in the opposition and nobody questioned them. Well, we're doing the questioning now. Every government must be, be made accountable. They wanted to get in the government to deal with the crime situation. Are they dealing with it? That's the question. The views of the people out there, up to yesterday, I was at, uh, moving around the, the city, and people were talking about the crime situation. So we are just expressing and reflecting what the public opinion is all about. Uh -huh. um, Did I mention what? No, I didn't, I didn't use that word, though. You said the slap in the dis disappearance is a slap in the I dis didn't dis use departure. Dis disappearance. Oh, okay. Disappearance. Mm. Hold me to my words. 
hold me to my word because there is a tendency by some journalists to change my words and substitute it with their words. I would like my words to be used whenever I'm being quoted. Well, so then, what do you mean by this? What evidence do you have that he disappeared as opposed to departed? What is the question? I'm asking what evidence do you have that he disappeared as opposed to departed? And what do you make of your word, disappeared? Well, my friend, a county newspaper reports, a county newspaper reports, he failed to turn up for trial and a warrant has been issued for him. That's what I'm going by. I'm no longer the Minister of Home Affairs, so I'm not party to information from Kanu or the law enforcement agencies. So it all depends on how accurate that reporting was. As a former minister, what would you like to see done differently? What, what? As a former minister of Home Affairs, uh -huh. what would you have liked to see done differently to ensure that What would I have liked to see what? Done differently. What do you mean done differently? Done in, done in what way differently? Well, I don't know. I'm asking you. No, well, you ask the question. You have to be clear to me so that I can answer you clearly. What measures do you think could have been put in place to ensure that he, could, that he, that he appeared? That he didn't disappear? Yes. Or that he appeared in court? No. To ensure that he did not disappear. To ensure that he did not disappear. That is, what I would, uh, that is how I would put the question. Well, proceed. Okay? Well, put it this way. Law enforcement, Kanu, and others who are in the intelligence community know to do their jobs better than I do as a politician. And even if I were the Minister of Home Affairs, I would have been disappointed if such a situation would have arisen because I would have felt that they would have acted in a professional and the manner in order to ensure that he did not disappear. By extension, Roger Khan. Well, I don't want to go to Roger Khan. No, I, no, I, 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 listen. No, you could make your comparison in the press when you write your story. But to ask me at now to do a comparison between Dr. Ram and Roger Khan, my prerogative is not to go there. Sir, was Roger Khan a slap in the face of your government? I can't say that. I can't comment on that. Sir, you were the first minister. I am saying that I'm dealing with Dataram, yeah, and the slap in the face matter is in the context of Dataram's matter. Just like the Harley Ass minister, yeah. when he makes comments about Harley Ass, he says it in a certain context. Well, I'm saying that this disappearance act on the part of Mr. Dataram is put in a particular context. Would you deal with any other slap in the there face? Is no, there is no, um, what you call it, there is no um, national drug strategy master plan. So how are they dealing with these drug traffickers? They believe what the man said, that Kanu operatives bribed him. They believed it. They didn't have to say that we're all intelligent human this beings. So if they didn't believe it, why did they set up a commission of inquiry? To find out why the did they use the president's prerogative in the Constitution to set up a commission of inquiry to investigate a known drug lord? And then the drug lord turned back and slapped them in the face by disappearing. The man who they trusted. Sorry, it was during your government that the United States government attempted to get that around extradited. Mr. Harris, Mr. Adam Harris, and you all could print this how you want to print it, but use my words. Use my words. This tit for tat media technique that is used by some media operatives to say that, look, PPP, this happened under the PPP, so nothing is wrong with it happening under the AP and your AFC. There is precedent for it because it happened under you, and therefore nothing is wrong with it happening under the present government. It's a normal course or a natural course of things. Well, if that was the case, then we would never be having press conferences because we would all sit back, relax, fasten our safety belt for a safe ride into the good life that, uh, that is 
supposed to be provided by the Grange administration. Mr. Wayne, well, I'm not saying that it's right. I'm not saying because it happened then. And it well, happened that is how it appears to so me. What I am saying to you, sir, is that is your criticism warranted? Did Let the people judge. Let your readers judge whether the PVP's criticism is warranted. You publish what we say in toto and let the readers or the listeners judge for themselves. Don't editorialize what I say. Just say what I said, publish what I say. What is wrong to do, do you and your party believe that uh, you have the, the, the moral authority to criticize the current government when indeed there were similar acts of transgression when uh, the PP was in power? But it depends on what you mean by moral authority. What is your How definition? Can you to what is your the current government when uh, similar acts of transgression? Occurred? Exactly. That is precisely the point I made earlier dealing with Mr. Ar Adam yeah, Harris's commentary. We have all moral authority to comment on any development that is of a political, economic, or social nature that is impacting the Guyanese community and, in particular, our supporters. The community in general, the Guyanese community in general, and our supporters in particular. We have every moral authority to do so because we are a major stakeholder in the body politic of this country. This PPP, as I've said before, is not a two by three party that could be easily wished away. We have 32 seats in the National Assembly. So when our 32 MPs speak, they speak with the moral authority that has been vested in them by our supporters who voted to give them 32 seats in the National Assembly and more than 40 local authority areas. That is the genesis and the basis and the acquis of our moral authority as a political party, irrespective of what happened in the past. Because questions were also asked, what is the moral authority that Granger had? or any one of his acolytes who would have had press conferences when they were in the opposition to comment on a number of matters when they rigged elections over and over again since, 19, uh, since uh, 1973 onwards. Sir, when the then Home Affairs Minister Ronald Guy Raj spoke about removing the Georgetown prisons, was that part of a prison plan? Because it never materialized. No, well, at that time, we didn't have a strategic plan for the Guyana Prison Service. The strategic plan for the Guyana Prison Service was formulated at the time when I was the Minister of Home Affairs. But there were plans before. Uh, there, were, there were plans before, and perhaps it could have been part of the strategic plan that existed um, during the Ronald Gardrell's tenure at the Ministry of Home Affairs. And what did your plan suggest for the prison service? Well, it was a very big plan, you know, it's on the website. I don't know if they pulled it down for shame, um, for, sh uh, for, the, uh, for, for reasons of shame. Do you remember anything at all that you had planned for the prisons? The prisons oh, yes, you know? plenty of things. You, want, I, you could hold a special press conference on that one. I just tell me two things, no? Two things? That you had planned for the prison Number one was losing man. It was to be transformed into force offender prison. That is to say, all force offenders were to be relocated from Georgetown prisons and to be sent to the Lusignan prisons. All persons who were forced for the first time, they may have been smoking it before, but having been caught for the first time with small amounts of ganja, a spiff as they call it, those persons would have been sent to Lusignan as well. And that prison was supposed to be a reformatory prison as well. That's why we were seeking to change the name of the Ghana Prison Service to the Ghana Prisons and Correctional Services with the same Granger rejected because they didn't want to have nothing to do with Rohi. You remember that? <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Right. And we wanted the second one was uh, in respect of the. Um, the, the, no, no, no. 
Well, the Mary was to have been transformed into a kind of an industrial prison because they were producing things like concrete blocks um, and a whole host of other issues. They were more or less specializing in that. Mazaruni was supposed to be the agricultural hub of the uh, prison service, uh, Guyana prison service. So tractors and all the necessary accoutrements that were necessary to develop the agricultural, um, it was, there was a component called the Agricultural Development Plan for the prisons so as to make themselves sufficient in agricultural products, having regard to the fact that huge amounts of their um, budget for um, what is called a dietary is outsourced. So that was supposed to be, so there was a specialization plan component of the prison service in that. And then um, New Amsterdam, there were some reforms that were also planned for the women's prisons at New Amsterdam as well. So there were a host of issues that were in the prison service. But the whole idea was to transform the prison service, as the name suggested, Guyana prisons and correctional services. Just like Guyana police force, it was to change from Ga to Guyana police services. And then the fire department was to was to have the name Guyana Fire and Prevention um, Department rather than Guyana Fire Service. Mr. Rohi, um, your party commissioner is Jacob. Uh -huh. uh, I suspect the party too has criticized the, uh, the situation there at Jacob with respect to uh, transparency and so on. And in particular, the whole question concerning the procurement of radio communication sets. Um, but Mr. Uh, Luan Fee, the Chief Elections Officer, has said that basically GCOM has had little or nothing to do with the procurement of those items. Uh, it was done through the Tenta Board, it was done through uh, the Cabinet that gave us an objection at the time. So there is little or no basis for uh, really questioning GCOM as far as transparency and accountability are concerned with respect to the procurement of those items. Well, if, if, if GCOM is looking for, if Mr. Lowenfield is looking for what I would describe as a get-out-of-jail card, let him await the outcome of the audit. I don't want to comment on that because my comments would be strictly political. I don't think that's a political issue right now. So let the audit determine whether he should have a get-out-of-jail card on that subject. Oh, okay. Well, life itself, you know, life itself lends us, or I would say, the the, um, the typical Guyanese political observer. They don't have to be like us, who are what you call the political pundits or specialists in politics. But everybody is seeing the reality where uh, the uh, AFC, they went to the PNC Congress, and they made a lot of statements there which showed that they've, they've, not been, they've, not, they've, they've not been consumed into the warm embrace or the kiss of death of the, uh, of the PNC, the which, is the, which is the major part of the, that, that, which, that's your view, which is a major part of the APNU. So that's number one. Number two. We have seen, for example, where they had this special conference soon after the Joe Shanlin episode uh, on the China fiasco. Uh, they had this special conference where they were uh, seeking to clip the wings, as it were, of Mr. Harmon. But they failed to do so. In fact, instead of them clipping the wings of Mr. Jo Joe Harmon or Joe Shanlin, um, their wings were clipped instead. And so what we had was um, a situation where uh, Mr. Nagamutu et al. Uh, began, you know, embarking on some, what, we would, what we've described as singing for your supper tunes uh, for quite some time. And then we had the situation with, uh, the, the, where Mr. Nagamutu was supposed to chair cabinet. 
And Mr. Granger was made to understand read the Riot Act and told him in no uncertain terms, even before him the Constitution. I understand a copy of the Constitution was shown to Mr. Nagamutu, telling him, you know, uh, that as a constitutional, as a lawyer, he is expected to know that if the president that chairs cabinet and not the prime minister, only when the president is abroad, out of the jurisdiction, if a cabinet meeting is held, and if the president that determines whether a cabinet is being held or not, in his absence. So you don't really get to chair cabinet meetings even when the president is abroad. So this is here, so you're related to this? No, the first one is factual in the sense that he does not chair cabinet meetings. That's factual. Where's the leaks The one about him being told by Granger, well, that deep throat information. Where's the leaks say that um, there are occasions when he would chair cabinet even in the presence of Well, that his colleagues could say anything. His colleagues were the ones who defended Norton in the, in the commission of inquiry that was set up to investigate the bond issue. You know, so it's all of we are one family AP and UAFC story. Yeah. Mr. Roy, can I ask with respect to Jacob and the Bank Act? Yeah. Uh, uh, you said that you can you say that if your party is deliberately concocted a story to target Mr. Um, Mr. Lowenfield? Our party, the PPP, is not in the business of concocting stories. We are not in that business. So forget about that. So how so then on what basis? I can't answer that, Mr. Thing. I'm no, saying no you're you, you to ask a question. No, you, you just ask a know. question. You just ask the question. Ask you another question. Just a minute, one at a time. Una pregunta a la vez. I'm saying that we are not in the business of concocting stories because we are a responsible party. Even if you concoct a story, you are the one that will eventually discover that the story was not true. And then you will come to us and say, you know, big headlines, Kaito News, Sabok News, um, Demara Waves, and, and, and throw it in our faces. We can't afford that at this point in time. So That's the Mr. next question. So, Mr. Roy, if, you, if the party is not concocted a story against Mr. Lowenfield, mm. then on what basis did it uh, arrive at its conclusion that there was a lack of transparency in the procurement process um, in light of the fact that uh, your cabinet secretary at the time, the cabinet offered no objection, um, it was the role for the tender board, and so on, and of course it was not the budget agency at that time it came under the scrutiny of the Ministry of Finance. Well, I don't know where you're getting your information from. You obviously spoke to Mr. Lowenfield. I have not spoken to Mr. Lowenfield, so I would prefer to steer clear of that, and as I said before, to leave it in the hands of the auditors, let the auditors present their report so we could, you know, pronounce more authoritatively. All right, so for this, uh, aside from my references to Mr. Lowenfield, on what basis did the party come to the conclusion that it was a lack of transparency? Well, we heard the commissioners themselves speak at a meeting here, a press conference, that they were not party to any discussions on these matters. So I would say, you know, we give the benefit of, of the doubt to our commissioners. We believe what our commissioners say. Are you in a position, sir, to see what operated in GCOM when your party was in government? How did GCOM operate? Rather, um, what year are you mentioning? Show All the right, periods? Let's go, to, let's go from 2011 to 2015 chart. If mm -hmm. GCOM wanted something, how did it go about acquiring those things? Well, usually the uh, cabinet paper would come to cabinet, and the head of the presidential secretariat would deal with it at the cabinet. In this case, don't ask me if this one was done like that. I can't say. Because remember, remember, I read somewhere where they said that this was a last minute something that appeared suddenly. I can't say because I was here dealing with electoral issues all the time. So, you know, we were already in an electoral mood and the office of the president, everybody was busy with, I'm not saying that because they were busy, what had to be done was not done. But as far as I'm concerned, I was at Freedom House most of the time dealing with electoral issues. You are implying that that is a matter that went there. I just told you, Adam, that if you're seeking to have an explanation or to, or if you're seeking to um, 
suggests that what Mr. Lowenfield may have said, or if you're seeking to get from me then, if you're seeking to get from me something to um, resonate with Mr. Lowenfield vis-a-vis the role of government and cabinet, you won't get that from me. I can't provide you with Does that. Does the party want Mr. Lowenfield in this office or be replaced? We've already said in a public statement that Mr. Lowenfield's contract should not be renewed. We said that. We issued an official statement saying that. Uh, Mr. Rohi, <clears throat> you mentioned that monies are being uh, put around to satisfy the whims and fan fancies of the European uh, government. Can you give some examples? No, no, no. I, this, was this was in relation to the city council. Yes. I wasn't speaking in general. I, my statement or words on that matter was restricted mainly to what is happening at city council in the context of lack of transparency in accountability because if these people are saying that city council is broke, how come they're finding money to travel every time out the country, ever so often? And number two, they're finding money to pay a guard service to protect Mr. Hamilton Green's residence. So I am saying there's some inconsistency here. On the one hand, there's no money, but on the other hand, there's money to do certain things for their political friends and colleagues. So that's why we have concluded that the money is being used, that money is there, contrary to what they're saying about money not being there. And it is being used to satisfy their, their political whims and fancies. Any other question? <coughs> if not, ladies and gentlemen, of the, anything of the, of the state, of those comments? To work with everything. Like. Oh, no, I don't know when I go get you. All right. Um, if there's no other question, I want to invite the press tomorrow. We have two picketing exercises: one at the High Court at 11, and another at GCOM at 12. Where are you getting the High Court from? Well, we got the elections petition case. Democracy, we have Thank a right. Thank you very much. You know, you know,